your birthday and how long you've lived in Hernando County. My name is Elisa Ann Crum Platt. I have lived in the county 73 years. And what's your birthday? February the 8th, 1940. And what part of the county uh, did you live in for the majority of your life? My entire life, I have lived south of Brooksville on US 41 East on Crum Road. Back then, my grandfather, Papa, called it number five. The road, he titled the road US number five? US 41 was number five. Oh, okay. It was the fifth road built, He so he tells us. And uh, we it was a concrete road. Really? Yes. Okay. And did that make it any easier, any harder than it? I mean, was that considered sophisticated, I guess? Oh, yes. It, and we love to hear the little bump, bump, bumps as we rode with the cars because that's what it would do in between the division of the concrete slabs. Wow. And you can remember hearing that? Oh, yes. So yes. what was it like living in that area of the county as far back as you can remember? It was all family. We had a neighbor that was about a mile and a half when I was very young. And uh, we played with those and those children. Also, our 17 cousins lived in and about. So that was our friends and neighbors we didn't have. And uh, we uh, played at my grandfather's house and our house. And we didn't have hard surface. We had dirt roads. So if we had a bike, we had to push each other on the road because we had no hard surface anywhere, as the children did in Brooksville. And my aunt and uncle owned Pine Island, Old Pine Island. So that was a great adventure to go and swim at Pine Island. Wikiwachi River at the Sandbanks was a great alley that our folks would take us to. And uh, the cookouts that we had, we would have big cookouts with the families. And we met every Sunday at my grandfather and grandmother's, Papa and Grandma Crumb. And everybody would show up and there would be just a huge feast. So all of us would play out in the yard, the fields, and play chase and uh, throw things at each other like the China Berries. We'd climb on top of the lot house that kept the horses. And uh, we just had a great time with cousins. And uh, the food was always just amazing. Country food. Nothing was ever that I can remember store-bought. It, it, other than their coffee or things like that. And what would a meal have consisted of? Oh, it would be roast, it would be breads, it would be greens of any kind, all the vegetables that you could possibly, peas and rice, tomatoes, and the adults would get to sit in around the living, I mean the dining room, and the kids had to sit outside on the porch and eat, because there were more adults, and you so you just got your plate and you went and sat on the porch. And I understand your family was into uh, ranching and uh, farming. Yes. My papa uh, was born on the property that we own. And his father came down from Georgia. So it was cattle, and they raised corn, and uh, of course the row vegetables for home. And uh, daddy got into baling hay and then combining seed. So that was to sell and plant pastures. We had, in the beginning, it was over 300 acres of uh, pasture land that my folks owned. And when I was a kid growing up, the cattle were not tame. We had rammers. They were ranged because they can survive on anything. And that's a breed of cattle? Yes. And so that's what we had. And we were always being chased by a bad cow or bull. And my mother kept saying, you're gonna get my girls killed. You know, and we really didn't think anything about it. But we would drive the cattle in and it would take dogs and trucks and it was awful. Now that I look back, but as a kid, you just do it because you've been doing it that way. Well, I guess we were probably 16, 17. We said, Dad, you gotta get rid of some of these old longhorn cows, they're gonna kill us. And in fact, we had him in a pen, and of course we had to work him, there were no boys in the family. And he was moving some, and a horn went right up here and out. And I think that did it. So after that, he started investigating into Brangus, which is a breed of a Brammer and Angus. And it was a no-fence law. 
So that had to be in the early 60s. I don't remember exactly when it was. But Mr. Ayers, just south of us, had cattle everywhere on range, and he owned a lot of property. So he asked for all the, the cattlemen in the uh, county to uh, come and help him round up his cattle. And my papa was still alive at that time, and back then all the cowmen carried a rifle on their side because you never knew when you were going to see a wild bull, and they would, they're would they dangerous. And now we would have been in the area of Wikiwachi Prairie, and at that time there was water in the entire thing. Uh, today I couldn't even find the water. I was looking for it not long ago, and I said, where did it go? And uh, so we were all riding, and they give us a section to ride and drive the cattle up to a certain area. And we heard a shot, and then we heard some yelling. Well, cowboys yell to each other a hoop and a holler, and you know, we knew what it meant, because we would do that when we rode, if it was a long one or short one, we knew what that signal meant, because we didn't have walkies and we didn't have phones. Mm -hmm. And you just learn what that meant. So uh, we heard it, and we heard them yelling, and it meant climb a tree. So we found the old rambling oaks, and so we let the horses go. And sure enough, just across the little pond of Wikiwachi uh, Prairie was a bad bull with humongous horns. Well, we climbed the trees and let the horses go, and then the men started um, chasing the bull because he was going to hurt somebody or something, and they got him. And uh, we did that for a week or so, helping just a, a neighbor round up the cattle. Wow. Yeah, and people from all over the county came and helped him because there were so many. But my dad said that down on the swamp that they were never seen. That they'd never seen a person. They never came out. Because, and uh, wow. Yeah, because my dad uh, was uh, riding it. He, they wouldn't let us go into that. And... Um, he he'd said that, that some of them were so bad they were just going to go ahead and destroy them. And he brought a set of horns back that were huge. Really? So uh, there, we had wild cows as well. And that was as late as? Uh, well, I think that it was maybe the 60s when, early 60s when the uh, no fence law. In October, they would burn the entire sand hills so that the new wire grass would come up and that was so much fun to us kids because we would get to strike the matches and start the fires. And uh, then when the grass started coming up, we would move the cattle from Crumb Road all the way across 41 and drive the cattle all the way out to what is now around Silverthorne Powell Middle School. And we had a, a, a windmill. It right, probably right in the middle of where Silverthorn is today. And uh, Daddy built a big concrete vat for the cattle to have water. So we would leave them out there in the wintertime. And then in the summer, we had that same drive back home. And we never had to worry about a car coming to hit because there was no one <laughs> back when I was young. I mean, there was no cars. You didn't have to worry about it. What decade was this? Probably? That was the early, late 40s, early 50s. Okay. As kids, we went all over, and we also played all over the air base, you know, right there. Okay. Uh, and uh, my dad used the uh, buildings when he harvested his seed and used it for a hot house, hot houses, a bunch of them, because they were through with them, and the barracks were used as storage, and he would spread his seed out on the ground or on the floor and let it, the heat cure it. Wow. Yes. Oh, that's and of course, we would have to go out and help him rake it back and forth. Wasn't our favorite thing to do, but we knew we were going to do it. I mean, sure. that was just part of our job. Sure. Because my grandfather, as my parents told me, would come and pick me up and take me off on the horse when I was old enough to sit up. All the girls, there were no boys in my family. So all the girls did, and my cousin, who was a girl, uh, we did most of the cattle riding. I remember as a young child riding uh, uh, on the back of the truck with my cousins and my sisters to go hog hunt out in the sand hills because they had pens everywhere that they trapped them and then daddy would bring them back in to sell at the markets or 
the people from Tampa, especially the west side of Tampa, the Cubans and Italians, loved fresh pig. And they would come up and buy a truckload. We had a Malus Market, which is right downtown here. Uh, I, I, somebody's got a, a office or something in it now. But it was a meat market and also a food market. And they would call Daddy and say, I need da-da-da-da, three, four cows, whatever it was. So Daddy would go out, and these were all range fed. We didn't do grain fed back then. And they the meat was just delicious. And they because, would eat what they could find? Yeah, oh, we had plenty of grass. Oh, yeah, yeah. they were yeah. grass fed. And then in, in the wintertime, they got hay also. Mm -hmm. But uh, they would, um, and, and how you remember things, Daddy had a pickup, and we would go and cut palmetto fronds and put in the back of his truck to lay the meat on, and then they had a tarp to cover the meat going to town, which was only uh, six miles at the most, you know, to deliver it. And uh, they would go in the little side door to take the meat in. And he did a couple other stores that way, but uh, I can remember we all had to learn to butcher the cattle. We like to get the old pickup and go out in the sand hills and run the sand roads. <laughs> and my parents didn't care because back then there wasn't anybody on the road so we could drive. I mean, we were all driving by the time we were eight, nine years old. I mean, there wasn't anybody to worry about. <laughs> and uh, so we would uh, chase each other through the woods, you know, and, and just have a great time. My dad liked to quail hunt and so did I. So the minute he was up going, and this is at a very young age, we would go and park and we would walk all day hunting quail. Wow. And we also did that at the home place too because back then quail were everywhere. Hardly find them now. Hmm. If we hear one, we get excited. We heard a quail. But today, too many people, too many animals, and they're just not like they were abundant years ago. Uh, where the power lines are in Spring Hill, okay. they drilled a well, which was a test well, mm -hmm. and that was the spot that everyone met at, like, we called it dinner time, which is noon, because Southerners have breakfast, dinner, and supper. And so at, at dinner, we'd all meet up. And I was really young, I mean, probably 10, 11, and all the families would get together and eat together, just whatever they brought, a snack from home or whatever, and then go back out to hunt again. Wow. Yes, and, it, and cool. it was those memories I remember. My aunts were hunters also, my grandmother. So it goes back, way back into history that they all were hunters, which I love to do also. And you're still hunting? Yes, I am. I'm going uh, Friday. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and we'd saddle up our horses, and we would go out in the woods and camp. And we didn't even have a tent. Daddy would give us an old tarp and say, you can make a tent out, find a low, lot, a low limb. And so we'd throw it over the limb and tack it down, and then we'd stay the night. And it was just a bunch of girls doing it. Did you bring food or any other Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever we could find. Sometimes it was marshmallows. Sometimes it was sardines and crackers. I mean... We just whatever Mama said we could have, we took with us, and we didn't care. Hot dogs, we we would eat a hot dog, roast, build a fire, and roast them. Wow. And uh, and I assume you wouldn't bump into anybody else while you were out. There. No, we never saw anyone. No, 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 no. There was no one near where we lived. What school did you attend, and what was school like in your earliest memories? I attended Garden Grove School, which is near the corner of Forty One and Spring Hill Road now. And uh, it was a one-room school. Uh, it looked huge to me. It was probably 100 feet long. And we had six classes. It went one through six. And one teacher, and uh, Miss Lamar was our teacher, she would uh, begin with the older kids and teach them. And then she would tell them to come back and help teach with the younger. And those kids, the older kids, also chopped the wood for our heater, wood stove during the uh, winter. And uh, then we had a garden that everybody participated in. And I found it, we talked about this, a friend of mine, that we could play outside and there was no adult. <laughs> you know, you knew to behave yourself, you know. And uh, I look back now, you, you couldn't do that at all. 
But, uh, and then uh, the neighbor, we called her Aunt Lainey Munden, she was our cook. And the school a lunchroom still stands. The school itself is gone, but uh, neighbors would come, mothers would come and help her at noontime, you know, to cook, or they'd bring food. You know, if they had a pot of greens, they would bring those, mashed potatoes, whatever. And so, you know, they always were there to help. Everybody helped each other back in that day. You moved over to Brooksville uh, eventually. Mm -hmm. What was school like in, in Brooksville, just in general? Well, it, it was uh, a big brick building, which was just amazing to us. And it had a basement, which was another thing, you know, we were just totally surprised and excited about. It was because we just had a wooden building. And uh, there was a lot of uh, toys and things to play with, you know, and equipment we didn't have. All we had was a couple of limbs to swing on and you broke your own ropes to do jump rope or whatever you had at home you brought to the country school. But, uh, and every everything was uh, so much different because it was rooms. We, we didn't have rooms. We had a room. Wow. And uh, so that was really uh, different. And uh, a lot more, I remember a lot more books. We had very few books to look, read because, you know, of the country, but they had a library. And uh, so, yeah, it was a lot different back then. Every Saturday, uh, when we were very young, the uh, outlying area people from Hernando County would surround the courthouse. And the courthouse was open, so as children, we would run and play all through the courthouse, and we knew not to bother anything, because the doors were locked anyway, and back then you didn't really have to worry. And all the kids would play until, and the stores were open so that you could uh, go into the uh, shops and whatnot. But uh, the families would get together and then a lot of them would have whatever they had to sell on the corners. And then y the adults would visit with one another. And it was just a great Saturday to go to town. And if we were lucky, we could talk them into taking us to the movie. For a dime, we could get in and have popcorn and get in the movie. Do you have any specific memories of major events that shaped the way the county has developed over the years? Well, I think uh, when we had all the roads built back in the 50s, that all roads led to Hernando County. If you look, all roads lead to Hernando County. Hmm. And uh, then of course, people started seeing that there was a lot of land available. And of course, during the wintertime, uh, the northerners would come by droves going south, and they started staying one or two at the time. And then we noticed as children, we had more and more northerners coming to school, which, you know, we, we were, they're from New York, or they're from wherever. Right. that we had never seen, and they talked different than we did, sure. you know. And, uh, and I think that because people wanted to get away from whatever, they just started moving into here. I look as kids when we'd go out in the sand hills and where we played our subdivisions and schools and people and more people. Mm -hmm. There was a dirt road to get out there in and then dirt roads that went off all through the sand hills that, you know, and now this all hard surface. Do you remember more about maybe the political rallies they had locally? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. You would go, uh, in fact, Daddy was um, the uh, state chairman of the school board at one point, mm -hmm. and it was also the same year he was going to run for re-election. So he tells me, at, I was probably maybe 15, I can't remember now. And so he gives me this uh, paper and he says, I want you to memorize this and you go do a speech. And one was at Spring Lake and the other one was out at uh, Istichata. And I went, I can't do that. And he said, oh yeah, you can do that. A speech uh, supporting your father? Yes, then. yeah, okay. it, about him. I managed to do it. I was terrified, but I did. And also back in that day, they would hand out little cards that had their pictures and their name on it. And we still have some of those today. Uh, I'm a member of the First United Methodist Church since the 40s. And uh, we would have uh, 
an MYF meeting on a certain uh, Monday of the week or month, you know, or the month. And we would go to the other Methodist churches in the county oh. to meet with those kids. And that's how we really got to interact with other children. Right. And the area that you live in, I can I consider rural. Um, it was. Do you still feel the history there? And oh, yes. Like it resembles what it was during your youth? Well, yes, it does, because we still own it. It has been in, in our family for over 150 years because see, my uh, papa was born there and he died at 86. And, uh, and then my dad passed away at 91 in 09. So it's still our farmland, our cattle pasture. Mm -hmm. Even though we now live on it and the, we let the kids live on it, we still know that history's there. Mm -hmm. my, I asked my dad, because a friend of mine that I uh, work with, a substitute with at uh, Moton Elementary, asked me what that white brick building was. And this building is located where? Across uh, on Powell Road, uh, going east. Mm -hmm. And when you cross the railroad track, mm -hmm. it's right in front of you. On, on the right? Yes. Okay. On the right. So I'm thinking, I don't know where a white building is because I've seen it my entire life and not even can't see the forest for the trees. But anyway, so I made a note, and I went, oh, that's old kennel. Well, I got my dad, and I said, okay, Daddy, I want you to tell me about this building. I knew it was a sawmill. I mean, I remember when it was working, and when they loaded lumber on the side, you know, uh, sidecars on the railroad. And he started telling me that the white brick part came from the Munden Hill area where they had housed uh, Germans and they made the white brick. They had an old mule that was hooked up and he would go toward the Hope Hill, which is diagonal north and uh, northeast across the tracks. And they made a road and that mule would bring a log back to the mill to the sawmill. From Hope Hill Road. From Hope Hill Road, which I mean, you think it's a long way, but it really isn't that far. I mean, if you go through the woods. Sure. We can't do that today, but back then they could. Mm -hmm. And then they turned him around, and Daddy said he would walk back to that area where they were cutting, the sawyers were, and get another log and bring it back. And that time, though, Daddy said that they were using, uh, some were using cross-cut saws, and then they hooked up one to a belt to a tractor to make the sawmill run. And then they, as time went by, they had all the new stuff to cut. So they improvised. I remember when the mill was running, that, you know. That little, where that little white belt yes, is now? Yes, yeah. And there was a huge uh, sawdust pile, which all the local kids like to go play in, and really? they let us. It, and it was fun because it was so tall. Uh, a lot of watermelons every year. Yeah. I started driving the tractor when I was like nine. And Daddy was leaving me by the time I was 11 to do the plowing or disking or whatever. And I was plowing, and I'd look back because he'd always say, keep it straight, keep it straight. All right. So I looked back, and I saw something white, and I went, what was that? And I just stopped immediately. Well, in that area, Daddy told me that there had been a turpentine community. And when the turpentine ran out, they moved on. So I took that, it was a white pitcher. I made one little hairline crack in it. I could not believe it. So I got off, cleaned it up. It was buried, I mean, under the dirt. And I flipped it up. And also the turpentine cups and things like that, wow. which, you know, hangs on the tree for the sap to go into. Right, and so you found a, a pitcher that yes, a pitcher. used to pour the, turpentine? Right. No, no, no. Oh. This was like for household use. Oh. Okay. Yeah, because they were uh, buildings there, little oh, homes. Wow. And uh, so I took it home. I still have it today. Do you really? Yes. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's got a crack in it, but I just sit it off to the side and say, I dug that up. See, we would cow hunt out there, which would be all the way past uh, the theater, the, uh, what's the name, um, you, on 50. Oh, Be Beacon, I think? Yes. Yeah. Well, way past there. Uh, we had that as pasture all the way back over to where Spring Hill Drive is now, but that was no, there wasn't a road. And uh, we would rest after working all day on the horses 
as kids, I mean, we were still in the 50s, and Papa would get up under a tree somewhere, and we'd get off, and whatever Grandma put in his saddlebag, we ate at noontime. And we would run in the sinkholes, and the sinkholes have been around forever. Wow. They didn't just start appearing. We knew where all the sinkholes were. But I can remember as kids, uh, all my cousins and sisters and so forth, we'd run and play and pick up the uh, uh, arrowheads and throw them at each other. We never kept any of them because we didn't know then. You know, you know going, oh my goodness. What? High school years, after I was older, well, of course, I would, Daddy would, my parents would let me drive into town before I was 16. We would go the back way. Nobody was on Powell Road. In fact, I don't think it was even named Powell Road then. I can't, it seems like in the maybe late 50s or 60s, anyway, it became Powell. Okay. And, uh, but I would just go around the back way to Mitchell Road, come into town, and do whatever, or go to the to drive in, mm -hmm. and many times I would take Daddy's watermelon truck, which is a big truck with sides on it, and go park it in the back, and then all my friends would come and we'd sit on the back of his truck. Wow, it, and you walk. weren't even 16? No, then like, <laughs> I, they went long before I was 16. <laughs> but you didn't have to worry. I mean, there wasn't any cars anywhere. You know, when we were kids, we would sit down on 41, which uh, is the intersection of, of Powell and 41. My parents owned from the, the family on from there to the airport and then a mile to the railroad track. Wow. And, uh, but he would pile the melons up for us to sell and we would get so excited when a car came by. On 41? On 41. <laughs> yeah, so we could sell and we'd get out and wave to them and say, please buy a watermelon for 25 cents. And do you feel like the, these families that have been here for long periods of time, their children, their grandchildren are going to stay in Hernando County? Or do you see them leaving? Well, like mine, yeah. <laughs> if the rest of their families are, mine don't want to go anywhere. I mean, all of my kids really want to, and grandchildren want to come back. They love Hernando County. They love the farm. Mm -hmm. They love the family get togethers on Sunday that we do every Sunday. Wow. Yeah, uh, whether you're in town or not, the web goes out, you know, the new stuff. And we're eating at this time, bring whatever you can. Wow. And then all holidays, we all eat together. And uh, uh, my sister built a, a pool, so that's a great attraction. So all summer, everybody's, you bring a hot dog or a hamburger and you sit out there and cook it and eat and swim till black dark. Nice. Yeah, and now instead of horses, which we don't have anymore because they eat too much grass, and we found out that Four-wheelers and uh, mules, not riding mules, it's ATV things. We can do just as much as we can on a horse, and it doesn't need as much. Rue, and did I, well, I didn't even mention about the hog slaughter, did I? That was in December 1951. In fact, a Tribune person came out and did an interview with pictures and with uh, interviewing the family because it was daddy's five sisters and his brother and then all of Papa's aunts and so the extended family, wow. which would probably be 50, 75 people would be there and all the kids. Wow. Because they actually gave us jobs to do if you were old enough. Sure. And, but uh, they had this huge black vat and now I look and think, how did they know how to do that? They would stoke it and get it certain temperature, and then the hogs that we had raised, they would dip them and pull them out and then hang them, and they would scrape them because the hair, because they wanted to keep the skin for cracklings and whatnot. Nothing was ever wasted. And other folks came in, black and white, and everybody shared. And they would, this would be a two or three day process. For instance, one aunt would make patties, one aunt would make sausage, pork chops, everything you can think of, bacon, the whole thing. And uh, so the men would keep, keep it going cleaning and the kids would do whatever they were told to do as far as, and they had to hang them a huge six by six or whatever that board was. And they could hang like five or six hogs at the time. Over the weekend, daddy said the most he remembered, we did 50 hogs in a weekend. But now remember, that's extended families. 
They even had their own lard that they rendered and that everybody got a uh, five gallon can and they were like a copper colored can and you could put them in your uh, smokehouse and I, it never got rancid in those houses for some reason. And I can leave a jar of it for a month and then mine's already rancid, that's crazy. But anyway, and you would just go out and dip it because we had a, a, a meat house at my house, at my parents. And uh, if anybody needed food, they knew they could go to the potato house, the vegetable house, or wherever. And as kids, we would have to rake up the, the pine straw and cover all that to keep it nice and cool, summer, winter, whatever. Over the food in those yes. houses? Yeah, mm -hmm. like sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, carrots, I don't remember her doing, but the greens she canned. Uh, whatever she couldn't put out there was canned. She had a huge pantry that you could go in there to feed an army. How has the county changed in your time here? Uh, the thing that bothers me most, I guess, growing up with such a close-knit uh, community is we don't have that anymore. I mean, you can go to a store and no one even recognize you or you don't know them. And even, I noticed that even in the banks where you could walk in and everybody in the bank would, when I say the bank, because everyone used Hernando State Bank back in that day, and everybody knew you and they, and we knew them. And now it's, it's no longer that way. Right. Anything, I don't care where it is, any, any facility, mm -hmm. you know, and like schools, you, unless you're in that, you just don't know them. It's, we've lost that, uh, that touch.